Well, as we come into the fourth chapter, Paul is wrapping up this little epistle that he wrote from prison in Rome to the church in Philippi in Greece. And if you remember, even from prison, he writes this little letter, which is really his epistle of joy in the New Testament. It is, it is a letter just abounding in the joy of the Lord. In fact, four, four short chapters, the word joy or rejoicing is mentioned nothing less than 19 times. And so it's really, really the theme of his message here is, is the joy of the Lord. And obviously, despite circumstances. It's a joy that circumstances has nothing to do with. And so, uh, and th this is what he has been laying out. Now, he began wrapping it up, if you'll remember, in verse 1 of chapter 4, by saying this, Therefore, and I love the way he, he speaks to these people, My beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Notice the way he addresses these people. He obviously has a heart of, of deep love and compassion for these people. He's just overflowing with this, oh, oh, my longed for brethren, my joy, you're my crown. I love that. You know what I really love about it? We're not talking about just Paul's love for those people in Philippi. That's definitely What's, what's involved here, but that's not just what we're talking about. What is Paul doing here? He's reflecting God's love for those people. You know what he's doing? He's loving them with the love of the Lord. That's what's going on here. Now think about that for a minute. That's God's love for us. What Paul is, is sharing here is an expression of the love of God himself for you and I. Longed for brethren. You know what? There's a heart of God that, that is anxiously looking forward to being united with us in heaven. It's almost like God saying, I can't wait till you get here. You know? But his joy and his crown, you know, the Lord says those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ that have been purchased by his blood and received that redemption simply through faith in Jesus Christ God rejoices over those people because we're redeemed, you know? And, 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 and so he, he says in his word, he just rejoices over us. And Paul says, you're my crown. And a crown is a symbol of, of reward and glory. And to Paul, their presence in the presence of the Lord with him was, was reward enough. It was his reward. But think about that for a minute. Because in Isaiah chapter 53, in the prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ, it says that Christ will look at the result of his sufferings and be satisfied. It's sort of like, that's his reward. Us with him eternally. And so, and so our heavenly father, we are indeed in a very real way his joy, his crown of rejoicing, you know, we with him. Hallelujah. God loves you in that spirit. Paul loved those people in that spirit, simply a reflection of the love of the Lord in that spirit. And so he says here now, it's sort of right, right wrapping up this letter. He says, now, now here's my word to you. Stand fast in the Lord. Just stand fast. You know, hang in there in the Lord. In other words, with, with your, your faith and, and your trust and your hope squarely in Jesus Christ. You know, it, it just, you know, in, in his leading, however that leading goes and plays out in your life and his plan for your life, however that kind of plays out in your life, you're trusting him, your faith is in him, in his leading and in his plan and in his glorious salvation that he has planned for you, you know? That's, that's where your focus is. That's standing fast in the Lord with those things at the very heart of your, 
of, of your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, just stand fast now in the Lord. You know, it's not that long a path. It seems like it's going to go on forever, but we know as we get older, that is not the case. This goes pretty fast. So you just stand fast in the Lord. He has never dropped anyone yet, and he will not drop you. You trust him. It's all about faith. It's not about you hanging on to him for dear life. It's about faith that he's holding on to you. And he won't let go. And so, in that spirit, he goes on in verse 2 and says, <laughs> this is interesting, going to get a little personal with the body here. I implore Yodia and, Sin, and I implore Sintiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. Apparently, there's these two ladies that are having an issue with each other in the church, you know? And, and, and so there's, there's some, some, some unrest going on in the body. You know, it's, it, it's sort of like robbing the body of peace. We've got something going on here. We've got some drama in the church here. Uh, Yodia and Sintiki, you know, they're just not getting along very well. Ray Stedman called them odious and suntachi, you know? <laughs> And they were just, they were causing trouble in the church. And they were affecting kind of the peace of the body. And so uh, it's kind of interesting that it was affecting the body to such a degree that Paul wrote it in, a, in an inspired letter here. And 2,000 years later, Christians have been reading about Yodia and Syndiki all of these years. Just think, when we get to heaven, oh, you're Yodia. Oh, yeah, I know you. And we're sitting thinking, oh, we just love each other so much. <laughs> I know the Lord's got that all worked out, but it's, how would you like to have that reputation in heaven when you get to heaven? You're Yodi. <laughs> You're Sintiki, you know. But the Lord's good. But you know, you know what I like about this? What Paul, Paul his, his pastoral counsel to them. Get along. In other words, it's not about who's right or who's wrong. That's not even the issue here. It's, it's just get along. You see, when it comes to Christian conduct, it's not about being right. It's about being an instrument of his love in that situation. Now, we're not talking about sound doctrine, the, the pillars of the faith. We're talking about issues people get into with each other. And it's... It's not about being right. It's about allowing yourself to be an instrument of God's love in that situation. You know? So he just, he simply says this. I like, you know, he says in Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put all that away. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, listen, forgiving each other. How much? As much as Jesus Christ has forgiven you. Boy, there's no limit to that forgiveness. And he says, that's, that's, that's what we're to do in relation to one another, period. I mean, even to the extent in, what is it, 1 Corinthians, he's talking about Christians going to secular court against each other. And he says, why are you doing that? Brother against brother in a, in a worldly court? Can't you guys work this out in the Lord? You know? He says in that context, chapter 6, verse 7, Now therefore it's already an utter failure for you that you go to court against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Hey, let it go. You know, it would be better just to allow yourself to be out and out cheated than to go to court against a brother or a sister. You know, if you can't work it out, let God work it out. But you see, Paul, very simple. Hey, ladies, get along. Just get along. You know, bury the hatchet and get along. He goes on and says, uh, verse 3, And I urge you also, true 
companion. He's talking about somebody else. Somebody else here he calls true companion. No one knows exactly who that is. Some speculate it might have been the Philippian jailer. But he was somebody that he described as a true companion. And the, the word in the Greek means uh, co-yoked together. Somebody he yoked together. In other words, they, they, they are together in this work of the Lord. They are bonded and together. They're on the same team. They're serving the same Lord. They're, they're, they're one together in this work, you know. And, and, and he describes them in that spirit. We're together in this. We're a team in this. You know, I think too often there can be sort of an attitude of competition between believers. And the Lord says, no, no, no. We're just, you know, we're, we're a team in this. We're yoke fellow. We're true companions in the work of the Lord. To, to the degree we are such a team that any part that we have in encouraging, supporting, praying for, standing with somebody else in any ministry that they're involved in, we share, Scripture says, in the fruit of that ministry. We share in the reward of that ministry. You know what that means? That means here's this lady and she decides to sign up for the nursery on Sunday morning. I don't feel like going to the, working in the nursery. I don't really care, but they really have a need in the nursery. So I'm going to sign up to work in the nursery. Hint, hint. Anyway, and, and she signs up to work in the nursery because she's there working in the nursery. This little couple bring their little baby. They drop them off. And because they're free now to go to the service and, and not worry about their little baby and, and be a part of that service and give their full attention to that service, they, they get a call on their life through that to be a servant of the Lord in a certain way. And maybe they go out and they begin doing this wonderful work for the Lord. That little nursery attendant is part and parcel with the fruit and the reward of that work. She has a part in it. She shares in the fruit of that ministry. She shares in the eternal reward of that ministry. Hey, ladies, just think, little babies you've watched over the years, man, in church or something like that. And what God has done with their parents or what God's going to do with that little baby someday or has already done with it. You don't even know. You know, this thing is so intertwined and, and so orchestrated by the Lord. That's why we are going to be blown away at the judgment seat of Christ when he hands the rewards out. Absolutely blown away. What? I don't deserve that. Oh yes, because you did this and prayed that and stood in there and helped that person that did that and that. And it's all, it's all we're, we're a team together. Paul looks at this guy, you're my true companion. We're in this together. He goes on and says, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. You know, one thing Paul had a deep appreciation for was the way God was using women for the furthering of the gospel. You know, you think about it for a minute. They provided and ministered in, in, in such a way that helped the ministry of the gospel in areas that men totally are clutches at, you know. There was a group of ladies that went with Jesus and his disciples on his entire ministry. And they were there to minister to Jesus and to minister to the disciples in a way that women are very good at doing and men are very bad at doing. I'm sure they were taking, you know, good kind of motherly, sisterly care of those guys. And it was very deeply appreciated. There are gifts and calling in women that are unique, that men marvel at. They just look at it and say, wow, you know. Uh, and, and what a blessing. What a blessing, not just to men, but what a blessing to the body of Christ. You know, these ladies are involved in the ministry, you know. And, and, you know, Paul's pretty, you know, people look at Paul and say, oh, the guy's a male chauvinist because he won't let women pastor or whatever. But their contribution to the work of the gospel, remember, we're a team. We're a team and every part counts. Every part is vital. If, 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 if you want to be the big cheese, the big cajona in a ministry, you've got the wrong spirit. 
My counsel to you would be give that ministry up and go back and humble yourself and just be a servant somewhere for Jesus. You know, because we're all in the service of the king. And that ministry of these women was as vital to that work. Paul puts it right in there with this, with this true companion, with this guy Clement. We don't know anything about Clement, but what's interesting is we do have in church history a guy named Clement, Clement of Rome. He was the very earliest recording writings of a Christian were written by this guy Clement of Rome, still in the first century, approximately 96 AD. This could have been that guy. We don't know. But the point is, Paul lumps, lumps them all together and says, hey, help them out. They've been valuable to the ministry. Every single one of them. And so you can't rate the value of brethren in the ministry. You, you, we cannot do that. You know, what did Jesus say? Those who are last are going to be first. He said about the gifts of spirit, those that go unnoticed are the more valuable gifts. The big upfront gifts, they're the less valuable. So, he adds, and I love this part, whose names are in the book of life. <laughs> That's the best thing of all. That's the best. Remember when Jesus sent his disciples out, you know, and they went out and ministered and they came back and they were so excited. Even the demons are subject to us. We were casting demons out, you know, boo, and, and wow. And Jesus said, don't rejoice that, that you had power over demons, but rather rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Rejoice that your names are in the book of life. Because brethren, that's the bottom line. That's where it's at. That's settled eternally. And you know the cool thing about that, recorded in heaven, in the book of life, we're in. And, and it's, it's so beautiful because it is through your faith in Jesus. He's the one that made the way and got you there. And we're the one that received that as his gracious gift to us. With thanksgiving. I'm not trusting in myself to get there. I'm trusting in Jesus. Completely. 100%. For that place. And as such. Name in the book of life. And you know. Um, that means that. Whatever you're going through in this life. Whatever road the Lord may put you on. One thing we've all learned about life. Um. In, in the time we've been on it is um, uh, stuff happens. We get curves we weren't expecting. Uh, dreams and hopes get shattered. But whatever, whatever the Lord says, it's all right, I've got you. I've got a plan through all this. But the beauty of it for us, your name recorded in heaven, in the book of life, is you can go and it's sort of like this. I read the last chapter of the story that my life's a part of. And it's got an absolutely, gloriously happy ending. It's awesome. It ends really, really, really cool. And believe me, you can write over, the, the, over that story, and he, she, they lived happily ever after, and that's the gospel truth. So hallelujah. And Paul says, their names are in the book of life. Your names are in the book of life. That's, you know, that's that ticket to heaven. That's that, that assurance that there's a, a reserved place for you in glory. And Jesus made that place for you. Hallelujah. So, you know, this is kind of what he's striving at here. And with that, you know, um, he comes to the point here. Verse 4. So, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. 
There's the theme of the entire epistle right there. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, folks. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Notice he gives it a double emphasis here. For emphasis. Says it doubly. He says, listen to me. Listen. Rejoice. You can rejoice. You've got reason to rejoice. So rejoice in the Lord. Well, uh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can do that today. I mean, I can think of a lot of reasons maybe why I can't do that. And so Paul says, and again I will say, I'm going to say it again, listen, rejoice. Rejoice. He never says to rejoice in your circumstances. There's a lot of times that circumstances are not reason to rejoice. But you can always rejoice in the Lord. You can rejoice in the Lord because He's with you. He's with you. He's going to get you through whatever it is. Not only through it, but through it victoriously. Through it for a glorious good. That you'll look at and say, cool, that's really good. That's a hallelujah. And we're going to end up in heaven. We're going to end up in heaven. So, it's all good, huh? <laughs> Chad always says that. It's all good. It is. Rejoice in the Lord always. 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 And again, I say, he says, rejoice. So, Paul, with the emphasis, you know what he's saying here? Listen, just do it. Do it. Would you do it? Don't talk about it. Don't theorize about it. Do it. You know, it, it, ca it, it calls for a mind adjustment. You know, a little mind adjustment in there. Say, you know, I, I think I'm going to just look up and rejoice in Him. You know, it'll make a difference. It's a real key to victorious Christian living. In fact, I think he lays out here principles in this first part of this chapter of the victorious Christian living. And one here is rejoice in the Lord. And I'll say it again. Rejoice. And then he adds to that verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. That word gentleness is a pia case in the Greek. And it simply means a, a forbearing or a non-retaliatory spirit is the idea. In other words, when you feel you might have reason to retaliate, let it go. That's, that's the word. That's what that word means. Let it go. Don't get all huffy about it. Just let it go. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it's where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, very pointedly, don't return uh, evil for evil, but return good for evil. Just do that. You know? That's, that's the, the, the spirit behind that word right there. Paul echoes that in Romans chapter 12, where he says, do not be overcome by evil, but... Here's how you can overcome evil. With good. With good. And uh, this so complements that, that rejoicing in the Lord and goes with it. Because people can't often see what's going on in your heart. But they, when it comes to the way you react to people, boy, they notice that. They'll notice that. And and you can, you can, you can let it go. And if, do, if you're going to do anything about it, I've got to do something, do good. Think of something good you can do for that person. Praying for that person, maybe, maybe a concrete good thing and do that. And you can, and he tells us why. The last part of that verse, don't ever forget this. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. I'll tell you one thing that means. In a very 
you know, very practical way. He says in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See, the Lord is at hand, and you know what he's saying there? I'll handle it. You don't have to handle it. You don't have to get even. You don't have to do something to get back. You don't have to react. I will handle this. That's what he's saying. I'll handle it truthfully. I'll handle it righteously. So I'll just handle this. And because that is so true, and it's such a reality, and it's a promise of the Lord to his children, he goes on the next verse there in Romans 12 and says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Nobody quite knows what that coals of fire on the head means. I think the best guess is that it was a, it was a, a reference. It was a, 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 a symbolic way of saying you'll bring that person under deep conviction you know, of what they're doing. But the point about it is you can, uh, you know, you can, you can let it go. You can just let it go. You can forgive as Christ has forgiven you because the Lord is at hand. He hasn't gone anywhere. And he says, he says, first of all, I'll handle this. And second, because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. He's got you covered. Oh, somebody may rip you off, cheat you, do something, discredit you, uh, slander your reputation. All that could happen. Any of it could happen. But the Lord says, I've got you covered. Your reputation your well-being, your needs are in my hands. The Lord is at hand. Don't worry. And so you can let it go. And then the third reason, the Lord is at hand. Anytime he says that in the word, it always carries that little implication that he is coming soon. He's returning soon. And we don't know when. But it will be suddenly. And it could be any time. And he always wants us to have that anticipation that it's going to be soon that he's going to come. And now think of it. These little issues with other people won't and don't matter a bit when it comes to that. In fact, think of it. You know all they're good for? You know the little issues? The only thing they're really good for? They're good as an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord in that situation. That's what they're good for. Say, Lord, how can you use me for your glory in this situation? In fact, that's a really good thing to pray. You're praying about a situation, pray like that. Lord, this is, this is a mess. I don't like it. I don't like what's going on here. I don't like what people are saying or people are doing or whatever the case may be. How do you want to use me, Lord? How can I be an instrument of your glory and your love in this situation? Show me how, Lord. And let me do that. Because the moment he comes, none of, that, none of those issues even matter anymore. So what is that telling you? You know they don't matter when he comes. None of that's going to matter, huh? Huh? You know that, don't you? Amen? Do I hear an amen? amen? Amen. Doesn't matter. So why does it matter now? He's got you covered. So the Lord is at hand. So... Let that gentle spirit, that forbearing, that eh, let it go spirit, just let it be seen. It's a witness to the Lord. It's a witness to your faith in God. How can you do that? Why don't you do something about that? Oh, the Lord will take care of me. And the Lord will take care of this. Oh, oh, he's one of those weirdo faith people. Yeah. That's okay. It's like that song, you know. Well... You know, if you're going to be a freak, I'd just as soon be a freak for Jesus than anything else. Huh? So, I think that the Lord is at hand is sort of a hinge here. Because it looks back at that, that gentle spirit, let it be seen, you know. But it also looks ahead to what he says next. Because he says in verse 4, it's sort of like the Lord is at hand, be anxious for nothing. 
Be anxious for nothing. Now think about that for a minute. Do you realize that the Lord has just authorized, that we've been authorized by the Lord himself not to worry about a thing? That the Lord has absolutely set us free from having to worry about anything. He has authorized us not to worry about a single thing. You know, I've shared with you guys before, but I think about this person that was really worried about something and, and we prayed together about it and everything. And, and he, you know, he went away and he, he came back later and the Lord just worked in a beautiful way in that situation. And he was so rejoicing. And, uh, and I, I said to him, you know something? Last time you were in here, you were really being obedient to scripture. Oh, really? Really? How's that? Yeah, because you were so worried and, and the scripture commands us to be anxious for nothing. And you were, you were anxious for nothing. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's, that's what it comes down. The Lord is at hand. So, uh, we are authorized by him not to have to worry about a single thing. And with that, he goes on and says, but rather in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. You know, don't worry about anything. Rather pray about everything. And he says there, make your request. God is inviting you to make your request to him. Make that request to the Lord. And then the idea is commit the outcome to the Lord. Make the request and then commit the outcome to the Lord. Trust his wisdom in this matter. Trust his timing in this matter. And so you make that request, committing it to him, committing the outcome to him, and trusting his wisdom in how he answers that prayer and his timing for answering that prayer. And he says, always, when you make requests and supplication before the Lord in the Spirit, do it, he says, with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. That's important because that puts a positive spin on your praying. Instead of your praying coming, oh no, Lord, help. Oh, oh, this is awful. I don't know what to do. God, help me. You know, instead of that, you can't do that and pray with thanksgiving at the same time. And so he says, always pray with thanks, thanksgiving. Pray, let your prayer be characterized by thanking him. Well, what do you mean? How can we do that when we don't know what's going to happen? What are we going to thank him for? We're going to thank him that now we have placed this situation, this need, this request, this desire in his omnipotent hands. They're in the, it, it's in his hands now. And he will, as he's promised, to help me through this and to work this out for, for my good, for his glory and according to his will. I have that absolute assurance. And so with thanksgiving, turns it over to him, knowing these things, uh, confident in these things. And it says, Lord, I'm really kind of anxious now to see what you're going to do with this. I've committed it to you. I've made my request before you. Now I'll see what you're going to do with it. You know? And when it's done in that spirit... And it's done in that confidence in your Lord. Notice what he says in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. You know, when you've prayed in that spirit, and you've committed it in that way, his peace is your your your. Your, his gift to you. His peace. His peace. Years ago, there was an art contest in Chicago. And the theme of it was peace. You know, make a painting that describes peace. And there were a, a lot of paintings that were submitted to this contest. And a lot of them, you know, had tranquil lakes, you know. Maybe, you know, a little fisherman out there with his hat down and his line over, you know, and all different kind of little images of, of peace. You know, the, the, the painting that won the award was a painting of a raging waterfall. 
and a little little cliff right next to this raging waterfall little branch going out and a, a bird had built a little nest on that little branch by that waterfall and here was a mother sitting on the nest and the little chicks little baby birds peeking out like that and they said now that's peace that's peace. in the midst of turbulence in 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 situations where there could be a lot of fear there is assurance and peace I'm okay I'm okay and that's the peace he's talking about here you know he says it surpasses all understanding in other words there's no human reason to have that peace maybe nothing has happened to solve the situation but, and so there's no human reason to have that peace. And no one can really understand how you can have that peace. But there it is. It, it's there. You've got it. And that peace, what's it doing? It's guarding your heart and your mind. The heart is the seat of your emotions. Instead of, you know, you know becoming an, an emotional wreck, his peace is is guarding your emotions and it's guarding your mind that's that's your thinking that's your reasoning that's that's your mind you know in, in, in instead of just skyrocketing out into left field somewhere like our minds can do it guards our minds it guards our heart his peace and he says you commit those things that could cause anxiety you bring him to me in prayer and commit him to me in that way. And I have my peace for you. Now let me say this about that. Because I know a lot of times you can, you can say, well, I prayed about it. And I said, <laughs> thank you, Lord. And, and I don't feel I've got the peace. This comes, brethren, when you've truly given it to the Lord you've given it to him and that you truly realize it's now in his hands it really is no doubt about it and he is working it out according to his will I don't know what's going to happen here but I know that he's got it and it's in his hands now. It really is. And he is working it out according to his will. And you know what? That's the best that can happen here. That's the very best that can happen here. And that, regardless of how I may feel, is what I want more than anything else. I want his will in this matter. I want his answer to this prayer. I don't want what I want. I want what he wants to do here. That's what I really want. I know that's what I want. That's what you want. You just think you want A. But God says, oh, believe me, you don't. You want B. And I'm doing B. Okay. You see? But when you've released it, you've given it over to him, and you know he's got it. And you know, because he said so, he's going to work this thing out according to his plan, his purpose, and his will. And that's a good thing. That's the best. Then guess what? The peace of God which surpasses human understanding guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Because that's where it's found. And so with that, with that, victorious Christian living, brethren, he goes on now and adds this in sort of wrapping up these thoughts. Finally, brethren, verse 8, what, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Let your mind dwell on these things. Here's the point, brethren. The key to having joy in your heart is having the right thoughts in your mind. Huh? 
And uh, what kind of thoughts? And he, he, he just lays them out. These kinds of thoughts, those things that are true, those things that are noble or they're honorable, those things that are just, that means they're right, those things that are pure, those things that are lovely, those things that are of good report. In other words, they're commendable. Those things that are virtuous, that are praiseworthy. Let your mind dwell, meditate on, focus on those things with your mind. Think of it for a minute. You know, you stay up late and you watch some late night television, you know. Or, 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 or you're sitting there bleary eyed looking at garbage on the computer. And, and you go to bed with that on your mind. You're going to wake up grumpy, you know, and, and, and cynical at the world and everything. But you fill your mind with what, what he's talking about here. These things that are really good. Like what? Like his word. Like the word. You know? Like, like fellowship. Like prayer. Those things. Praise. Worship. Like that. You watch. <laughs> you, more than likely, you wake up the next morning uh, with a a light heart and a, and, a, and, a, and a song in your heart, you know? Brethren, um, you, we are what we think. And so, you want joy and you want peace in your life? Then choose the good stuff to put your mind on. And that's what Paul is saying here. Because that's where the battle is fought. It's not out there. It's in here. So, you know, focus your mind on those things. And with that, he says, verse 9, and we wrap it up with this tonight. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. It's like Paul saying, I've taught you these things. I've showed you these things. You've seen them exemplified in my life. Now listen, just do it. Do it. It's like James says. Don't just sit there, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and then go on. And life as usual. Do it. That's what he's saying. And like Paul, the God, don't you love this? The God of peace will be with you. You know what I like about that? In verse 7, he said, you will have the peace of God. In verse 9, he says, you will experience, you will have the God of peace. It's like it's, it, it's taking it to the next level, isn't it? You, you start with, you know, giving this to the Lord and, and having the peace of God. But then you, 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 you apply this to your life and, and, and now you experience the God of peace. You experience his presence, you know. Him, as well as his peace. Wow. So victorious Christian living, brethren. Guard your mind. Guard your mind. Pray about everything. With thanksgiving. Because that's going to put that positive spin on that prayer. And you can, and, and, you, it, it, and it's good in that prayer to think consciously about the reasons that you can give thanks to God in that situation. And then rejoice in the Lord. Always. Make that pattern of your life. Just rejoicing in Him. And God will be with you just like He was with Paul. That's what he says. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you that your plan for us in this walk is a good one. Despite the, the curves that come, despite the, uh, the, the pitfalls, Lord, your plan is one that your love and your peace and your joy would keep us and our hearts and our minds secure 
in Jesus Christ. And there's good reason for that. Because you are our sovereign Lord who is in control. And you have declared yourself our good shepherd. And so Lord, thank you. Thank you that Paul from prison, writing that letter to the Philippians, assured us that we can, every single day of our life, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in you. So, Father, amen to that. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.